everyone. Good morning from very freezing Toronto. Good afternoon and good evening to our amazing panelists and global audience joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live. A very, very warm welcome to Green Hope Foundation's final webinar of this year. My name is Kehkesha. I am the founder president of Green Hope Foundation, and I will be your moderator for this session. 2020, the year it was, a year that shook us to our core, a year that will go down in history as the year that has engulfed so many of our societies in poverty, hunger, and misery. And it's difficult to find adjectives or even superlatives to describe 2020, a year that has impacted all of humanity in a manner that has not been experienced in our living memories. And not a single country has been left untouched by the economic and social impacts of this virus. The news of the vaccine is like a beacon of hope, but while the vaccine will provide the much needed resistance to this virus, we need much more to put our societies back onto the path of progress. And like any other disaster, its effects have been disproportionately severe on marginalized and vulnerable communities, the scale and depth of which is yet to be ascertained. We cannot let this happen again. And in this age of technology, when we have reached the frontiers of space, when we have the ability to clone life, when 5G networks enable us to reach the farthest corners of our planet, it is unthinkable and unforgivable that we were caught unprepared and unawares. And it's as much the fault of the leadership as it is of civil society. So we must learn the lessons and do so quickly so that in the coming years, we can make our societies, our economies, and our environment more resilient. And it is with this objective that Green Hope's final webinar of 2020 has brought together our world's most eminent experts and thought leaders to introspect on 2020, the eye-opener it was, and extract tangible takeaways that will enable us to create a new normal. So without any further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa, President of the 73rd United Nations General Assembly, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense, Ecuador, and Counselor of the World Future Council. Ms. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you so, so much, uh, Kekashan, for bringing us together this morning, but not only for this uh, end of the year seminar, but uh, because of uh, your steadfast effort uh, to make uh, this world a better place. I've been part of dialogues throughout the year. I have been watching closely how you connect spaces of dialogue with actual a change on the ground and, and I really admire uh, your inspiring leadership. You have been awarded several prizes. I, I lost track already, you know, Forbes and so many other uh, international acknowledgements of your great work. So uh, I am privileged, you know, to be, uh, to, to have been part of uh, the platforms and the spaces uh, for, you know, co-creating and, and thinking what, what is uh, going on in, in our world. So thank you for that. Thank you for uh, convening this meeting on the 2020, uh, the eye opener it was. And of course, greetings uh, to our panelists this morning. And I think that you said it all, you know, uh, this pandemic has been uh, an eye opener for humanity and uh, the pandemic has shown us uh, how interconnected uh, we are as human beings, uh, despite of all the sophistication of science, of technological developments, 
uh, throughout the last decades, uh, we are indeed facing an unprecedented humanitarian crisis in, due to a microscopic virus. You know, it has you know, completely made our world a, a chaos. And um, I think that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, if you have to learn something about it, is it has shown how fragile we are as a species and has also magnified existing vulnerabilities. I think that this episode of, of history has been a true tragedy. You know, uh, 76, close to 77 million people have been infected globally and uh, over 1.7 million have uh, so far lost their lives. So it is not uh, a, an issue to take uh, lightly. And, uh, and I think that uh, in addition to that, the virus has been the cause of the gravest um, socioeconomic crisis since the, since the Second World War and, and, and the Big Depression. So with, with trillions uh, poured into economic relief and recovery. So, but uh, you know, we have to also acknowledge that crisis and chaos can also be a moment of renaissance uh, as a moment of reset for uh, the world as the Secretary General of the UN has stated. A moment of rebirth and we can and should be part of this, uh, of this moment of, of rebirth, of this rebuilding moment. And uh, you posed, you sent a few questions in, in what could, uh, could we have done better? And, and I think that there are several, uh, you know, teachings uh, of, of this year and, and uh, you know, all these contradictions that we live on. Uh, you know, the, the pandemic has uh, not only brought uh, to the surface inequalities, injustice, the human rights and the nature's rights crisis, but has also made more visible you know, poor governance, and we have to acknowledge that, lack of leadership, weak cooperation and solidarity when it was needed the most. But also, unfortunately, it has put the 2030 agenda further from our reach. And um, just to cite a few numbers that are striking, you know, the last report of FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, showed that COVID-19 has increased hunger worldwide estimated that this pandemic will tip over 130 million more people into chronic hunger by the end of this 2020. So as we have these very pressing priorities, such as to feed the world, uh, to save human lives, especially children and youth uh, and women, uh, the world's main economic priorities are driven, unfortunately, in the opposite direction. Uh, we continue to invest millions, billions in weapons. And perhaps uh, my dear brother, Lacina Zerbo, would, uh, you know, uh, um, provide some light on, on, this, uh, on these issues. And even at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, in just 90 days, for example, an extra profit of 2.7 trillion was generated by the top world millionaires. Meanwhile, we only need 5 billion to save 30 million people from famine. So this is the world we live in, you know, a world full of contradictions. And, uh, you know, but as mentioned with every crisis, uh, the poorest and the most vulnerable have been and continue to be disproportionately affected by the pandemic, including women, girls, children, older persons, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, migrants and refugees. And this is one area where we, ca we, we ha could have done much better, you know, to have uh, the necessary safe, safe, safety net nets to respond to the most vulnerable. But we have still a pending homework uh, to, to, to do collectively. You know? It is not only the role of messianic leaders, it's a role of leadership of uh, society as a whole. We all have a role to play. And of course, you know, our elected leaders should also take uh, charge of, of, this, uh, of this main and critical responsibility. So I think that, uh, you know, to be uh, very specific and concrete, things where we need improvement for next year, uh, universal health coverage and our universal health coverage commitments. Uh, 
we have known already that access to basic health care is a fundamental human right. And now findings show that in many countries, the poor and vulnerable are being further left behind in the midst of a global health crisis. So that is a very concrete area where we need to invest more, invest more, perform better in universal health coverage and make the systemic changes in the way health system currently uh, run. That, that is one of the first issues. The second is what I would say, follow science and avoid politicization of the pandemic. And that has been uh, also very important. Um, timely and accurate information, uh, follow the guidance, the rules, the protocols, and follow the information of science. Uh, this is the second area where perhaps we might need uh, to do better uh, next year. Um, follow and, and have a clear early warning protocols. We weren't prepared in this uh, um, space and the gap between uh, the, uh, the declaration of the pandemic between uh, WHO and following uh, the protocols, uh, the warning, the guidance from WHO. This time was critical and some countries had to pay a high price because of that. And as mentioned, the other area is uh, cooperation and solidarity. Unfortunately, we found in several areas of the world uh, a lack of cooperation, of concerted action, of understanding that no one is safe until everybody's safe. We are experiencing, as we speak, what we call a vaccine nationalism. Everybody trying to grab as many vaccines as they can without understanding that vaccines should be treated as a public good uh, with uh, access and, and, and uh, for everybody in every corner of our planet. So to democratize access, access to vaccines is one of the critical challenges for, ne uh, for next year. So I think that uh, concerted action, global cooperation, these are big words, but they have to really, really happen, especially next year. Next year should be the year for nature, for re reconciling with nature, but also the year for greater solidarity and, and cooperation. And, and we have ignored for so many years some indications, nature talking to us in a way, the way nature talks to us to say you can not continue with the same uh, production and consumption patterns. You have to change the way you, know, you relate to your natural environment. So nature speaks to us, for example, through climate, climate crisis, to say enough, you cannot continue to change the um, chemical composition of the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is a, is a global public good. The nature is talking to us through zoonotic diseases and not only COVID-19, but Ebola uh, um, and so many other diseases, SARS, that are from uh, you know, nature-based nature origin because we have a broken you know, the harmony between humans and nature. So nature is saying, please stop. Please, let's reconcile. Let's, you know, uh, um, commit it to a new pact between nature, society, the economy, and politics. And we are given now the opportunity to do so. And, and I think it's a win-win situation because we are also experienced a crisis of public trust. Uh, people, especially young people like you, Kakashan, Lad Pragna, Erin, uh, they have, they do not feel they are protected in that our leaders are, are taking the right decisions sometimes. So this cr crisis of public trust is a prerequisite uh, to ensure strong democratic systems, to know how to listen to every member of society and, and create policies and laws based on the full participation and engagement from all sectors of society, including, of course, youth. And, um, and, and I think we need to
to overcome this uh, trust deficit in our institutions, in our international uh, governance structures as well. So I think that the question we must ask uh, ourselves just to close is uh, how to move forward uh, to create stronger, more resilient societies uh, and uh, how is that we are listening and responding to the needs, anxieties, and fears of those uh, who we are trying uh, to help and work for? And uh, this is not a light question. This is, I think, a defining question uh, for, for the future. And, uh, and I think that, um, as I mentioned before, you know, a crisis, a moment of chaos, is also a moment of rebirth, of rethinking, of reconciling with nature. And uh, so we should not forget that next year, 2021, is going to be a super year for nature. Why? Because for the first time in history, we are uh, having the three conferences of the parties of the three Rio conventions, Convention on Biological Diversity, the Climate Change Convention in, in Glasgow, the desertification uh, conference of the parties uh, in, in Germany early 2021, plus the, um, the um, Food Systems Summit and the Oceans World Conference, all happening in 2021. And I'm not trying to say here that conferences solve every problem, but it gives us an opportunity to recommit, to have a coherent narrative regarding the much needed pact uh, of reconciliation with nature, but perhaps more importantly, the reconciliation among humans, among ourselves. And, and I think we also need to make peace uh, among us, uh, between us. And that uh, would be also, you know, the seed for a stronger cooperation, for stronger solidarity, for stronger concerted action. Uh, it is not a secret that I am a, a strong defender of the role of the United Nations in its 75th anniversary. And I see every day, believe me, every day, how hard uh, you know, the, the UN team works at the ground level in regional offices, making the difference. And I think that the UN should be you know, fully funded uh, given the power it needs uh, to uh, deploy, you know, its mandates. But for that, we need also our leaders to take the right decisions. And we need us, you know, civil society, young people, academics, scientists, the private sector, to really come together, you know, to co-build uh, a much needed uh, world that is less unequal, less violent, more resilient, more nature friendly. And uh, so I, I have uh, great hopes that 2021 is going to be a much better year than this one. And we will have the opportunity to come together to build a better world for all. Uh, back to you, Kikashin. Thank you. And it is a privilege to be here in this closing a uh, dialogue of the year uh, uh, in your company and in the company of Audrey, of my brother Lassina, of all of you today. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. And back to you, Kikashin. Thank you so much, Ms. Maria. And we are very privileged to have experts and thought leaders such as yourself to be able to guide us on the path towards rebuilding better. And you are right, crisis and chaos can definitely be a moment uh, of a renaissance, of a rebirth, of rebuilding. And we all, as society, have to be a part of this moment. And next year is so crucial for us for reconciling with nature and not just with nature, but also amongst us as human beings with greater cooperation and solidarity. And we definitely have to start heeding the warnings of nature so that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. And we have to use this pandemic as an opportunity to yes, rebuild better, but also rebuild our public trust within all sectors of society, as you so rightly said. So thank you once again. I would now like to invite our next panelist, Dr. Lucina Zerbo, Executive Secretary, 
Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Dr. Zerbo, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Kekashan. It's uh, great to be with you again on this uh, virtual floor. Uh, Excellencies, my uh, dear sister Maria Fernandez, I think she started with uh, an overview, uh, which is a sign of uh, the work that she did as president of the uh, General Assembly. Uh, Maria Fernandez gave us uh, the mixture of what uh, policy, science, and civil society can bring to play in dealing with a pandemic and dealing with the challenges of this world as well. I wanted to say welcome as well to Audrey. Uh, we share a panel last time, so it's always great to see you. And then uh, to other distinguished panelists uh, that are meeting the first time. And then to you young people, uh, ladies and, uh, and, uh, and men uh, who are striving to make a difference for our world. So what a pleasure. So uh, we approach the end of this dramatic year, uh, the lesson learned from it, and the ways forward. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to be at this webinar and, uh, and also I wish to express my admiration for the work that uh, the Green Hope Foundation is doing. Uh, Kekashan, uh, you've shown that youth and children have a voice that needs to be heard and uh, you've been working on issues such as climate justice, peace, development, uh, gender equality, social justice since you were 12. So what an inspiration uh, you are to all of us. So your commitment to building a better world resonates strongly with me, uh, because as an executive secretary of the CTBTO, in 2016, I created the CTBTO Youth Group. And since then, I've seen a group develop and grow. Uh, the group, which is now almost a thousand member from 110 countries, has become a tireless advocate of the entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and youth empowerment. So the members play a leading role in amplifying the linkages between a test ban and peace, security, and sustainable development. Like you, they inspire all of us to do better. Today, we are asked to access, to assess I would say the impact of the pandemic, which touched every nation, big or small. And I think uh, Maria Fernandez said it quite rightly to say, nobody's safe until everyone is safe. And that's key. So we talk about nation, uh, big and small. So in many senses, humanity finds itself at a crossroad as we approach 2021. Uh, Will it be the year when countries turn inward or cease collaborating? And uh, Maria Fernandez talked about global cooperation. Or will it be the year when we all work together to build, as you, Kekashan, once call it, the culture of peace? So I will share with you today you know, my view, both as executive secretary, but also some uh, personal thoughts. First. Let's say that we must acknowledge that we are not yet in a post-COVID phase. We are facing with a new rise and a recognition that the acute phase of the pandemic may be with us for some time yet. All the same, it is right and proper to think about what comes next. For me, one of the answer is to better leverage the work of scientists to create a stronger link between science and politics. And I think Maria Fernandez said the same thing because she said, let's follow science. On your second point, that's what you say. Let's follow science to avoid politicization of the pandemic. And then let's work towards, in future, clear early warning. So, there have been a, a lot of uh, talk about countries not working together and about supposed failing in science. But I believe the way forward means a more scientific approach to policy making within and between countries. If we are to prevent and adequately respond to similar events in future, we need more scientific cooperation, more science diplomacy than ever before. And we also need a greater public understanding of science. 
at the CTBTO and the CTBTO itself though, as an organization has always been, has always seen science as an essential to achieving our goal of ending nuclear tests forever. We operate a state-of-art international monitoring system. I don't have to be uh, in, to go into the detail, but that range from monitoring the effect of climate change to tsunami as our prime work is to monitor nuclear test explosion. Secondly, we need more international cooperation, notwithstanding the nationalist calls we have been hearing far too often in the last years. It will thus come as no surprise that I hope the same holds for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, which are so important to peace and global prosperity in the long term. This year, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists Doomsday Clock has been set as close as 100 seconds to midnight. Much has been said recently about the crisis of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament architecture. Rethinking disarmament requires a serious understanding of the tenets of the current geopolitical landscape and overcoming as well, not only defined national interests. Despite the current global uncertainty, it is my hope that COVID-19 becomes a watershed moment for multilateralism. And uh, Ms. Maria Fernandez uh, did paint this global uh, picture quite well. Pandemic, climate change, hunger, arms control, and peace building. All of these are problems that reach across boundaries and require shared responses. So rather than backing away from cooperation and collaboration, we must grasp the post-COVID opportunity to strengthen the organizations, institutions, and the legal instrument that provide peace. It would be no surprise that I say that the CTBT is one of them, same as many other international agreements. But finally, what we should do is should not forget to be grateful. And this is key. When Maria said, nobody is safe until everyone is safe, it's all about being grateful as well. For all that has been achieved, we have to be grateful. This year marked the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and the 50th anniversary of the entry into force of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. As we emerge from the shadow of the COVID next year, we will also reach another milestone. It's the 25th anniversary of the opening for signature of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and the fifth anniversary of the historic UN Security Council resolution on the CTBT, Resolution 2310-216. But while being grateful, we should not forget to expand our horizon and to be mindful of others suffering. Saying this, I have the developing world in mind. The pandemic has brought great suffering and tragedies to all countries globally, but its consequences will be incomparably more dire and long lasting for the developing world. As you know, I'm from Burkina Faso, and I'm sure many have heard and probably don't know what this country is all about. And I've witnessed firsthand COVID's consequences on my continent. Africa. Up to 40% of children taken out of school due to COVID will never go back to studying. Child pregnancy among adolescents have soared, while international help has declined. The 20 cents US dollar a day that could have saved a hungry child's life might now be directed by developed countries to their own internal needs. And this is understandable. We can complain about that. But what would happen to that child? My answer to this is education and focus on the next generation. And Kekashan talks more about it and better than I do because he's bringing the voice of the youth to talk about the need for education and no need for weapon, as she once said. We need your spirit. Kekasian, we need all of you, your spirit and tenacity as the next generation of global leaders. 
our future will be determined by the decision we make now. And let us all commit to strengthening the culture of peace through bringing, for instance, and you won't blame me for that, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty into force. Through working together on scientific solutions, as mentioned by my dear sister, uh, Maria Fernandez, to share problems, and through leaving no one behind. Because I repeat, and I like what you said, Fernanda, Maria Fernandez, nobody is safe until everyone is safe. So I look forward to hearing the rest of the discussion and to responding to any question that arrives. Thank you, Kekashan, for having me in this wonderful panel. Thanks to all. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerban. We are very happy that we have so many interdisciplinary panelists to be able to uh, really take forward this dialogue as we really try to see what can we do in this post-COVID world and, what, and how to not repeat the mistakes of the past. So thank you once again. We definitely need more of international cooperation and not continue to extend the nationalist cause, as you said, and this holds very true for nuclear disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation. And definitely COVID-19, uh, if it becomes the watershed moment for multilateralism, then we would have really been able to rebuild better. And of course, we have to focus on the farthest first so that we truly leave no one behind, as you said, and as we rebuild better. And that has to begin with focusing on education instead of focusing on weapons of mass destruction. So thank you so much once again. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Madame Audrey Kiragawa, founder president of the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation. Madame Kiragawa, the floor is yours. Madame Kiragawa, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Kikashan, and the Green Hope Foundation for this invitation to be on the panel today and have this opportunity to reflect with all of you on 2020 and the unprecedented global experiences which this year brought to us. And in the reflection of what could have been done better, it's not as if we didn't know about the dangers of pandemics since within the last decade, we've experienced swine flu, Ebola, MERS, COVID-19, and an increasing spread and a rising of viruses as well as mutant strains as these viruses just as the U UK is experiencing today. So I think it is very important, um, as uh, Ms. Maria Espinoza said, that we look at the issue of leadership. And in the article by Mary Puppenfuss in the Huffington Post, which appeared earlier this year, she indicated that the US Department of Health and Human Services last year set up a months long simulated exercise that showed the nation was really unprepared for a pandemic. Then the current administration took little action to respond to many of the lessons learned. And the exercise code name Crimson Contagion had eerie similarities to the current real life coronavirus pandemic, which we are all experiencing. And the exercise involved officials from more than a dozen federal agencies, several states and hospitals, responding to a scenario in which a pandemic would begin in China and spread by international tourists and be deemed a pandemic 47 days after the first outbreak. So by then in the scenario, 110 million Americans were expected to become ill. And we can see around the globe that this uh, you know, scenario was not too far from what we are all experiencing. And the simulation that ran from January to August exposed problems that including funding shortfalls, muddled leadership roles, scarce resources, and a hodgepodge of responses from cities and states. And it also became apparent that the US was incapable of quickly manufacturing adequate equipment and medicines for such an emergency. And the US is not alone in this situation, as many of the shortfalls have been ex experienced by different countries around the world. And the White House officials told the Times 
that an executive order following the exercise improved the availability of flu vaccines, but the administration also said it moved this year to increase funding for a pandemic program in the Department of Health and Human Services. But the administration actually eliminated a pandemic unit within the Department of Homeland Security in 2018. And weeks after the first real coronavirus case was diagnosed in the US, a 2021 budget proposal calling for a $693.3 million reduction in funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Officials wouldn't explain why the administration's coronavirus response was so slow to roll out testing or to move on promoting social distancing and school closings, all steps highlighted in the exercise. And while the current president claimed that nobody knew there would be a pandemic of this proportion, that's exactly the kind of possibility this exercise addressed. So the administration also had the benefit of lessons learned by the Obama administration in dealing with the Ebola crisis. And the Obama aides in early 2017 ran an exercise for pandemic preparedness for incoming officials of the current administration as part of the transitional process. But almost all of the previous administration's experts had left the government by last year. So the former director of national intelligence, Dan Coates, who was fired by the current president in 2019, warned of the danger of a pandemic to an unprepared nation last year in his worldwide threat assessment. And the threat report warned that the US will remain vulnerable to the next flu pandemic or large scale outbreak of a contagious disease that could lead to massive deaths and disability, severely affect the world economy, strain international resources, and increase calls on the US for support. Now, Time Magazine also reported that the presentation of this year's threat assessment to members of Congress was held up by the current administration. And the report warned that the US was unprepared for a pandemic. Therefore, it's not as if we did not have the warnings or a pandemic threat was not already in place. The current administration did not act on the information. And this kind of laxity and ignoring the facts and not implementing the threat assessment recommendations is not only indicative of the United States, but other countries as well. However, the issue of leadership is exceedingly important. And the indications that we ignored have been that we missed the fact that while it is important to deal with symptoms that have already been made manifest, we need to go to causation. And the increase in the viruses that have impacted large numbers of people around the world are attributable directly to our mismanagement of the earth and our incursion into and destruction of the rainforests, as Ms. Espinoza has so clearly articulated. And I'd like to go more deeply into that because I want to call out the tremendous work of the UN Environment uh, Protections Interfaith Rainforest Initiative for the really amazing work which they did that made the direct correlation of the destruction of our rainforests and the rise of zoonotic diseases. And I want to call your attention to this wonderful issue primer, which they have incre uh, released on forests and pandemics, how protecting tropical forests can prevent coronaviruses and other emerging diseases. Now this document can be found on the Religions for Peace International website and will be also made available on the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation when it launches in the very near future. And it is also available on the uh, sponsoring organizations of the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative. You should feel free to go to its website and feel free to download this very, very important document. So come, uh, some key facts presented in this issue primer call to our attention that tropical deforestation and the destruction of wildlife habitat create the conditions for the emergence of new diseases to which humans have little resistance and which can become the basis for pandemics. 
and human encroachment into tropical forests, driven by land conversion for agriculture and demand for commodities like beef, soy, and palm oil, is leading to animal to human interactions that did not previously exist, enabling these pathogens, once found only in animals, to jump to human hosts. And COVID-19, like Ebola, SARS, avian flu, and other recent epidemics, is an infectious disease that originated from animals. So the COVID-19 pandemic and the potential for future pandemics are closely tied to tropical deforestation, habitat loss, ecosystem decline, and the many ways that humanity is mismanaging nature. And the steps and actions that should be taken now, both immediate and in the long term, to help us become more resilient. And I would just like to highlight just about three points. Of course, there are many that can be raised. But in the interest of time, I'll say that one, we have to practice flexibility and learn to more rapidly adapt to the ever-changing external landscape more and more as we see greater migration and refugees arising out of not just as a result of man-made conflict, but as a consequence of climate change with growing disasters, increases in viruses, we have to understand more deeply our need to be in a state of preparedness to make rapid and substantial changes. Secondly, as we see the possibility of failed states whether local, national, or international, that have become frozen in their inability to address and deliver needed services in times of crisis, and really have been unable to meet the needs of its citizenry, it will be within the hands of civil society to step forward and to fill the gaps. Historically, faith-based organizations have been doing that for years because of the principles and values of helping others, those in need, developing the heart of compassion and caring have been fundamental to the values in faith-based organizations. These disasters, pandemics, and so forth are already on our global landscape. So we must proactively create now those mechanisms and logical, logistical pathways to be able to respond more quickly to those in need of help. And third, there should be greater support and funding for the Center for Disease Control, as well as the World Health Organization, which have in many ways become political footballs, subject to the political games being played, which have weakened their informational, monitoring, reporting, and research mechanisms when their funding sources are cut. And we need to restore necessary funding and preclude political maneuvering because the world needs truthful, factual information about pandemics as well as the best scientific advice and minds on how we can best deal with these pandemics. And uh, Mr. Zerbo indicated that it is very important to bring this coherence between politics and our institutions, and he is exactly correct. And the challenges that I foresee in the coming year I feel would be to one, deal with the inequalities that have been starkly presented to us as a result of this coronavirus. And we have seen that people of color, primarily black and brown, have disproportionately suffered because of the systemic and institutional racism that exists. And until we can do an honest assessment of our history and work very diligently towards addressing our history and the way that uh, we have created these problems through the calcification of certain mindsets and enculturation of beliefs, we can never be a fully wholesome society. So this also includes the indigenous people who have also suffered at the hands of institutional and systemic racism and discrimination because of the long histories of the tremendous marginalization and degradation of indigenous peoples as well. And secondly, we also have to see the evaporation of the moderating balance of the middle class, the accumulation of wealth into fewer hands at the top, and the growing masses of poor 
What this means is that we have to deepen our analysis to go to causation and understand what policies and institutions we, we have created for the last 50 years that have become the vectors of this disparity. And I would like to call to your attention to the most skillful analysis written 20 years ago by David Corton in his book, When Corporations Rule the World. This critique of the many symptoms which have been generated at the level of causation is more important than ever. And I commend everyone to read this seminal book. Until these aspects that this pandemic has brought to the forefront of our attention, I foresee that these challenges will continue to be highlighted as pressing need for attention and remediation. And this ultimately calls for each of us to be grateful, as Lucina Zerbo has said, but that we each have the highest duty to develop the heart of compassion, kindness, and love for each other. And may we learn the ways of respectful public and private discourses that honors the dignity and sacredness of life within each one of us and all sentient beings. So thank you so much, Kekashan, and all of our panelists. And I do wish everyone happy holidays and a new year that will be filled with peace, good health, and goodwill. Thank you so much, Madam Kiragawa. And yes, it is definitely all of our hope that the new year will bring forth so much more prosperity and peace than this year, 2020. And yeah, you know, it is truly horrifying to note that, you know, it's not as if we did not know that a pandemic of this magnitude would be possible. But what is really sad is that the indications were ignored and actions were not taken. And yes, definitely until and unless we do an honest assessment of our history and see where we went wrong, we cannot move further uh, because we will still then be repeating the mistakes of the past. So we have to recognize that and ensure that as we move towards the future, we do not repeat these same mistakes. So thank you so much once again. I'd now like to invite our next panelist, her Excellency Eldis Polak Bihla, who is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Suriname. Ms. Eldis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kakishan. Um, let me first apologize because I'm trying to get the camera on, but it won't go. Um, but I believe uh, with what I would say, um, maybe that will anyway connect us. Uh, much of what I wanted to say is already said by Maria and uh, Dr. Serbo and Audrey just now. Um, but let me first commend you and the Green Hope for such an excellent uh, job that you are undertaking um, in these challenging times. It's commendable um, to see how um, you have managed the innovation uh, and ICT to still hear our voices and to bring us together to ponder on what is to come um, as a matter of what has been. Um, so that said, um, we are very proud of you and uh, the Green Hope Foundation. Um, let me first start off by uh, saying that I think that we all did not expect it, the COVID-19 pandemic. We didn't. Um, at least the magnitude in which it has hit us all um, was not anticipated. And uh, I believe for that reason, our responses generally were slow. But at the time that we re realized that everything, our social, economic, cultural, and other aspects of life would have been impacted we were able to adjust. And I was happy to hear from you this morning that in Canada, for instance, the response has been um, perfect. I believe uh, in our, our region as well, we were, uh, the Caribbean region was one of the last regions to um, come out and say that we had COVID-19 cases and also we were able to have more time to prepare ourselves uh, as a matter of fact. But um, to say that 
we were we were expecting it no we were all very caught by surprise and then you have to develop first uh, um, policies and a, a rapid response and bring together emergency services and uh, provide a balance between the social economic and health aspects of life and i think that was the main challenge globally how would you what would you prioritize Is it the health of the people and at the same time um, seeing an economy deteriorating further and um, in that in that in that choice or that mixture of things uh, um, you have to then look at um, the very important uh, um, uh, uh, world standard of the UN um, that we leave no one behind and I'm not sure if we are better off. In my own assessment, I think we're a bit further off uh, the 2030 agenda because with COVID, a lot of people have been left behind. Um, if I think of, I, I thought of picking out two, two, two topics in this regard, education and, and social economic impact. And for me in education, um, looking at children that are living in remote areas and um, out of internet facilities, definitely we, we, we will have a group that is left behind. And if we take it at the scale of um, countries, um, Audrey referred to them as a failed states, but maybe not failed states, developed and uh, on the developed countries or less developed countries, then you know that there is need for more global cohesion, a global response, uh, a global coming together to provide more support to those countries that are uh, facing weaker health systems, weaker educational systems, and weaker social economic systems. So in that regard, I believe that not all children will um, become better um, after this whole pandemic has been, uh, is behind us. The second point that I wanted to make was on the social economic uh, level. What we could say is that with COVID-19, there was a level of understanding that emanated from it, that life is not only about the big things, Families, at the same time you hear families are gathering together again. Um, you you, you ov obviously start seeing some positive, but also in, if you look at those, those disabled and women and rural people again, they, they face it at a, at a different level, the consequences of COVID-19, because they have to deal with maybe five or six families in one small house. Uh, or they have to deal with food uh, on, at the table, scarcity, and so on. So the social economic impacts at the, from, at, at the health and family level, uh, you could say there has been a possibility to come together back as a family, but what about those that cannot come together in a family setting? So that is a uh, key and um, we need to somehow measure it um, to find out how we could provide more support. And here I want to echo uh, the point that Audrey made, the civil society and the faith-based organizations. I think that there is a crucial and big role for, for that group or those groups at large, at the global level, but also national and regional level wh where they can come in and develop programs and projects to um, assist, I would say, those that are vulnerable. And again, my, my plug is more about looking at the vulnerable that are the children and uh, women and those uh, disabled and not capacitated to um, take care of their own own, own, own sustainability. And then um, I would say that 
if you have to look into, into the future, even as we will be, as there will be the introduction of uh, vac vaccination and, um, and, and, and um, the accessibility of vaccination, we need to think of those that will not be able to get it in general. Uh, um, and, and yeah, I know that globally, they are prioritiz prioritizing the elderly and um, those that are working in the, in the health sector. But I think that there is need for global advocacy to also look at um, how will we treat with minority groups that don't necessarily have their own uh, voice um, to deal with, 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 with not being left behind. Um, then I, I, I believe that for the, for the future, we, we have an incredible task or opportunity, an incredible opportunity to um, somehow introduce equity again. Um, uh, equity at the level of um, wealth distribution and accessibility to health services and social services. Um, they are very much, uh, uh, well, they are instruments. I heard uh, Dr. Sirbo speaking about uh, the, the UN resolutions and so forth. Um, but I believe there needs to be a global conversation um, on how we would distribute or help those that are mostly in need and that are willing to rebuild stronger after the pandemic. And in such a way, I see 2021 as a year of opportunity um, for small businesses, for new um, um, ways of education development, for new ways of, uh, of, of uh, reaching out to each other, but more so to increase the call for global peace and uh, camaraderie, so, for lack of a better word, so to say. So, um, um, if, if I may wrap up uh, in a nutshell, uh, for me, um, this uh, time that we're facing, uh, we would need joint efforts. No one will be able, no one single person, no one single nation or region uh, would be able to overcome uh, this COVID pandemic by itself. It calls for a joining of hands across the board, um, regardless of ethnicity or political affiliation or um, small, large, rich or poor, we would need, it sounds maybe a little idealistic, eh? <laughs> but that's what we need in this hour for 2021 to have a practical response. But at the same time, as I'm wrapping up, I believe that there is a responsibility also at the citizenry level. And that's why I think this is such a commendable effort because um, we as citizens have to also think of um, COVID-19 as not being a far of our bad show um, issue, but we have to adhere to the simple things that we are, well, we are proposed to adhere to, like wearing masks and um, washing hands and um, making sure that we keep the social distancing but not becoming socially distanced. <laughs> so to me, there is also a huge task uh, on all of us, each global citizen, each citizen uh, to contribute to what we would have never ever thought 2020 would be like. So I endorse the comments and sentiments expressed by the previous panelists but I wanted to pitch in these few thoughts um, as part of my uh, reflection. So uh, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much. And yes, the onus is really on us to now rebuild better and uh, have to reintroduce equity in all areas, especially as you said, in terms of wealth distribution, access to health services to truly ensure a life of dignity for all. So thank you so much once again.
And with that, I would like to invite our next panelist, His Excellency Dr. Paul Alquist Kelly, Minister of National Policies of the Republic of Nicaragua. Dr. Alquist is unable to join us in person today, but he will be joining us via video message. So here is his video. Greetings to the Admirable Green Hope Foundation. 2020, COVID-19, extreme inequality, climate ambition, and finance. The world now faces simultaneously the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, the long lockdowns, the Great Depression 2020, extreme inequality, and the initiation of the Second Cold War. During the Great Depression 1929, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt famously pronounced, all we have to fear is fear itself. In 2020, fear has gone viral and confidence in the future has turned into despair. Inequality. Recovery will require the reestablishment of confidence in the future and hope, as well as greater equality. We should remember that the Great Depression to 1929 only ended with major redistribution, social security insurance, and the Second World War. The financial crisis of 1907 was followed by the 16th Amendment in 1913 of the U.S. Constitution, which approved a progressive income tax, a major redistribution. The Long Depression of 20 years, it ended in 1890 with major redistributions, the Sherman Antitrust Act, and the breakup of Rockefeller's oil, Carnegie Steel, and Harriman's railway monopolies the most powerful interests in the country. After the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, there was no redistribution, zilch, nothing. And this is how it came to be that 2,153 billionaires in the world have more wealth than 4.6 billion people. Finally, the 22 richest men in the world have more wealth than all of the women in Africa. If in the decade 2010, all we contemplate are recurrent outbreaks of COVID-19 and re-lockdowns, falling GDPs, and accelerating inequality, with Jeff Bezos making 43 billion in four months, while in the same period 50 million US workers filed for first time unemployment insurance, the depression will become both economic and of the collective psyche. In such a deep abyss, Customers will spend very little, investors will invest very little, and the economy will recover very slowly. Climate ambition. An additional way to restore confidence and hope for the future is for COP26 in Glasgow to officially declare that it is adopting the scientific panel's IPCC analysis and goals on how to limit climate change in this century to 1.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. This involves two decisions. One, achieve a sustainable circular net zero emission society by 2050. Two, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by minus 45% by 2030 to position ourselves for the 2050 objective. The United Kingdom and Italy as the host need to achieve the commitment of the 10 countries with the highest emissions. They account for 72% of all emissions while the 100 countries with least emissions account for only 3%. Secretary General Antonio Guterres declared COP25 the ambition COP because since Paris in 2015, the commitments have not added up to the goal of 1.5 degrees centigrade or even 2 degrees centigrade. Nicaragua did not sign the 2015 Paris Agreement because the collective commitments led the world to an average of 3.7 degrees. That would mean four to six degrees in the tropics, deserts, and Arctic region, a catastrophe. By 2017, there was a widespread consensus on the lack of an ambition, which led Nicaragua to siren the Paris Agreement and join the consensus that Gutierrez sought to unsuccessfully mobilize in Madrid. The historical significance of Glasgow is assured even a year before the conference, be it negative or positive. If it were to fail, it will be the end of the United Nations climate negotiations. 
the credibility of the process cannot survive two consecutive failures. Success will save the climate negotiation process. If the zero emission society is not the first priority for recovery, it will not sail, in that it will sink in a sea of competing priorities. Climate finance. The Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Accord, as well as the expiring Kyoto Protocol, all state that developed countries have an obligation to supply finance, technology, and capacity building to developing countries. The annual 100 billion commitment uh, they came in 2009 in Copenhagen it is supposed to begin in 2020. However, there is no working group or roadmap being prepared. Concerned about the negative impact of non-compliance on the credibility of the entire climate negotiating process, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez invited French President Emmanuel Macron and Jamaican Prime Minister Andrew Holness to formulate a proposal on the 100 billion dollars annual uh, financing. The problem is that the appetite for developed country treasuries has already been tested and it amounts to less than 15 billion for 2018 to 2023 based on green climate fund and global environment facility replenishments. Thus the solution has to be found in other places to wit the private sources the uses of the annual 100 billion can be grants, loans, equity financing, or guarantees to accelerate implementation as well as assure safeguards that funds should be channeled through the financial mechanisms of the Climate Change Convention. That would meet the developing countries' requisites of new, additional, predictable financing that is equally accessible and allocated according to the priorities of the developing countries. An International Renewable Energy Investment Fund, International Energy Efficiency Fund, and International Forestry Investment Fund with good internal rates of return could tap institutional equity investment. Nothing could restore the credibility of the climate negotiations or set a more positive tone for COP26 in Glasgow than to announce that the annual 100 billion for 2020 and 2021 have been assured with public funding and private institutional investor support for climate investment funds. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his two December speech at Columbia University broadcast by the BBC highlighted the enormous amounts of capital in the world of pension funds and could have added insurance investment funds and self-sovereign wealth funds. We have the financial resources to invest in the 1.5 degree centigrade world that avoids the worst consequences of climate change. What we have to do is reallocate. This is our last best hope. We cannot fail ourselves and our progeny. Thank you very much and much success to the Green Hope Foundation and in all of its endeavors. Thank you so much, Dr. Oquis, for sharing your views with us. And definitely we do need to reallocate resources to where it's needed the most. And absolutely the success of the current conventions and COPs has to be extremely successful. Otherwise we will not be able to progress in our uh, climate change negotiations. So thank you so much once again. And thank you so much to our amazing panelists for this wonderful discussion. And we shall now take uh, questions from the audience. And the first question is from Duty. So Duty, you will be joining us as a panelist. Thank you, panelists. My name is Duty. My question is for all the panelists. How can we get more children back to school? Thank you, Duty, for your question. Who would like to take that? Yes. Uh, Dr. Zerbo, you talked about education. So would you like to take that question? Yeah, I can. Uh... <clears throat> You know, thinking about the, the question, it's, um, 
a great and difficult question, but I would say in short, I would say to get children back to school, we have to get people like yourself to be an inspiration for them and for their parents. Because when I look at you, Kekashan, and uh, you know, group of uh, young people around you in the Green Hope Foundation, of course, I can only talk about what you do and what education can lead young people to be exactly like you know, what you are today. And that uh, Ms. Espinoza mentioned about uh, you know, all the awards that you know, we can't even name that you at this age, you've gathered already. So we all in our respective capacity are ambassadors, uh, not only for our countries, but for the world, depending on where we sit and what we do. And if I take myself as a child from Burkina Faso, uh, I think I do, and I am an inspiration as well from many people, from the uh, many young uh, children from the African community. Because when I go back and then talk to school, talk to a primary school or kindergarten, the question they ask, how have you managed to be where you are? I want to be like you. And I'm sure many girls around you, Kekashan, uh, at a younger age, they want to be like you. So we have to inspire more young people and then not only them, but their parents may see in us, all of us from all ages, uh, to be an inspiration, not only for them, but for their children. And the children will push them by the way, I want to be like a cushion. So I want to go to school because in a few years, this is what I want to do. I think that's how we have to start because when they push, we'll find the means because you need finance to take people to school today. So what we have to do is not only the inspiration, but to bring people around, to join that inspiration and then create a critical mass where we can get more and more people and encourage them and encourage them as well with the financial means and then to do many more projects in that respect. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerbo. Would any of our other panelists like to answer? Uh, yes, Madam Kitagawa. You're on mute. Thank you so much. That is a very important question. And of course, we have all felt the impact of not having children in school with the disruption of you know, the ability of parents and their work situation as well. But a lot of it will depend on the policies on the ground in the respective communities and the impact of the coronavirus within that respective community. So we have seen uh, basically a community by community response rather than a national uh, response uh, by country. So, you know, the COVID-19, as it continues uh, this pandemic, a lot uh, needs to happen so that students can learn and thrive without raising the risk of spreading the virus. So the goal of having children attend schools in person, which is how they learn best really, and to socialize with their peers, is only safe when a community has the spread of the virus under control. And then when it is possible to open a school for in-person learning, a layered approach is needed to keep students, teachers, and staff safe. Because a lot of children also return to families that have, may have vulnerable and health compromised members. And so it is always a, it is really primarily a public health issue, even while we can currently recognize the importance of children on many levels, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, educationally, to be able to be in a school setting to maximize their entire social, social socialization processes. So, but uh, in light of the current pandemic, the public health issue really needs to be addressed first and foremost. I'm on mute now. Uh, yes, absolutely. Ms. Maria, I saw that you unmuted. Uh, yes, indeed. I just wanted to, to add to the excellent question and responses from uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, I would like to, to just repeat something that my dear sister Ildis mentioned, uh, which is uh, extremely important, which is digital exclusion. And, and we have, uh, we have to, to remember something that is critical and has uh, been critical in this pandemic. You know, uh, 
you know, two thirds, two thirds uh, of the world school age children, uh, or, you know, 1.3, I think, billion children do not have access uh, to internet connection. And um, I think that, I think it's a last report from, from UNICEF and ITU that mentioned that. So I think that uh, when we think about green recovery uh, after COVID, we, we should also think about a digital inclusion recovery. Because, uh, you know, we know that uh, homeschooling has been uh, the rule uh, during this pandemic. And we need to ensure uh, that uh, children worldwide have access uh, to broadband and are connected to the world. Uh, these 1.3 billion are excluded, but if you look at girls, you know, girls and the numbers go higher, women and girls in general, half of the world is not connected to the internet. But when it comes to women and girls, this half comes up to four and five percent more. So I inclusion and to combat digital inequalities. And uh, this is something extremely important that was already mentioned, I said, as said, uh, by my sister, Ildis uh, during her intervention. I just wanted to, to uh, add that. Thank you so much, Miss Maria. And I would request all of our panelists to stay on for a little longer after the uh, projected end time, because we do have lots of questions from all of our members. So uh, that's a humble request from us. And the next question is from Whitney. Uh, Whitney, you have the floor. Hello everyone. Thank you panelists for the great discussion. I am Whitney Padayashi from Seychelles. I have a question for all the panelists. How can we change the trade and financing mechanism so as to address the current issues of inequality and environmental degradation? Thank, Thank you, you for your question. Would anyone like to take that? Madam Kiragawa, let's begin with you this time, since you talked about the rainforest and the spread of zoonotic diseases through uh, nature. So you have the floor. Yes, thank you so much, Whitney. And it's wonderful to know that you are calling in to this broadcast from the Seychelles. And of course, the Seychelles is also a very vulnerable place because of its you know, proximity uh, to the oceans. And I myself am from Hawaii which is an archipelago in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And over the years, I myself, as I continue to fly back and forth between New York City and my home in Hawaii, have seen the rising tides. And on the North Shore of the island of Oahu, we have already seen large erosions of uh, beaches and land and the upcoming rise of the tide. So this issue of uh, climate change is very, very pressing. And it is indicated that the loss of biodiversity <clears throat> actually has been accelerated because of the climate changes. So the commitments that we make are very, very important to be able to try to stem the uh, climate change that is going to have major impact on all of our lives. And so with respect to your particular question on what we can change with, re with regarding trade and financing mechanisms, we are actually talking about the infrastructures that have been created based upon policies that have created the situation where we have seen, as I previously addressed, the rise of the wealth and accumulation into very few hands at the top. Uh, in popular lingo, we have called it the 1% the erosion of the middle class and the growing masses of the poor. What this is requires is our analysis first and foremost of what policies we have created as well as the institutions that we have created that have been prevalent within the last 50 years that have allowed this kind of trade and financing as well as the, um, you know, the incorporation and creating transnational corporations who have been deemed as persons and have the status of persons, especially within the legal mechanisms of the United States. And I think this kind of infrastructure 
uh, that have arisen and we have adhered to follows the mindset of this kind of a market fundamentalism, as I would call it. And these, this kind of market fundamentalism and the adherence of our values to all that is consumer and market-based that have so fashioned our consciousness to the things that we can buy and our value as, uh, as citizens in the world by our purchasing power, our consumption power, have really eroded our connection to the sacredness of Earth and the sacred life of all sentient beings. And so this kind of divestment of our connection to our sacred lives, to each other, and really understanding that the well-being should not be defined by the so-called indicator of gross domestic production, but we really need to reanalyze what it truly means to have economic well-being, and it is not uh, determined by this kind of GDP indicator, but we really need to re-examine that. So in that re-examination, in the succinct analysis, as I had mentioned in David Horton's book, When Corporations Rule the World, we can see how these trade and financing mechanisms and institutions mm -hmm. have been created and why it is very important that in the aspect of analysis, we can then come up with solutions. And I'll say that in any medical situation, diagnosis is primarily important because treatment follows diagnosis. And so too, in the analysis of our trade and financing mechanisms, we need to go to diagnosis causation as to how we have created this kind of mechanisms of trade and financing that ultimately have supported the many, many symptoms of dysfunction which our 17 Sustainable Development Goals are trying to address. But these are really symptomatic um, you know, uh, uh, situations which have arisen because we have not yet done the full and complete analysis that the diagnosis can follow proper treatment. So this is a hugely important question. It's a very deep and complex question, uh, but it is something that we need to bring to the forefront of our consciousness and our work if we are ever going to be able to address the cause of all of the symptoms with which we have been uh, facing and the issues of the environmental degradation and our incursion and misman into the rainforest and mismanagement have all become part of the symptoms. So uh, Whitney, I would highly recommend uh, and recommend not only to you, but to everyone that we study more critically the aspect of causation that has created these trade and financing mechanisms that have been participating in the uh, creation of all of the symptoms with which we are currently faced. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Kiragawa. And uh, we are uh, very short on time. So I think that the format for the next questions is that I will take uh, maybe three questions in a row and then I would request our panelists to answer those. Uh, so the next question is from Anshita. Anshita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, panelists, for such an amazing discussion. My name is Anshita and I'm from India. My question is that more women have lost jobs during pandemic despite getting paid less than men. So what steps need to be taken to remedy this in the future? Thank you, Anshita, for your question. Uh, the, our next question is from uh, Ariange. Ariange, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Ariange. And my question is to all the panelists. So what can be done to ensure food security? And who should be the one um, taking the lead for this? Thank you very much, Ariange. And uh, the third question is from uh, Sheikh Shafiola. So you have the floor. Are you able to hear us? No, yes, okay. yes, thank you. 
Thank you. This is Sheikh Shofiullah. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh. My question is to uh, all the panelists. With all nations coming together to fight the virus in an unprecedented manner, do you think this can act as a platform for finally achieving complete nuclear ablation? Thank you Thank very you. much for all of the questions on gender equality, on food security, and of course, nuclear abolition. So panelists, the floor is yours. Uh, Ms. Maria, let's begin with you this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kakashan. And, and thank you for, for the excellent, really very excellent questions, uh, Anshita, Duty, uh, Shaikh. I think uh, this, these are the, the, the critical issues uh, for, for the immediate future. And, and I think that, let me start uh, with how to close the gender, the gender gap. And uh, I think this, there are no easy recipes. There, there is no you, an easy fix for a historical um, gender inequality paradigm. And, and uh, you mentioned, you, you said it very well, you know, uh, women have been at the, at the first row, you know, frontliners in coping with COVID-19. We know and keep repeating that more than 73% of, of uh, health workers are female. Uh, we also know that so many heads of state and government, uh, female heads of state and government, have really shown strong leadership and assertiveness in handling COVID-19. We also know that uh, only 24, 25% of world parliamentarians are female. And the list can go on and on in terms of access to jobs, uh, in terms of uh, the gender uh, pay gap, uh, uh, you know, equal opportunities, uh, girls going to school, etc. All the numbers, really are not very promising. But I think that we do have a shared responsibility to make sure that we contribute uh, to, uh, uh, to close the gender equality gap. Uh, you know, before COVID-19 hit us, uh, studies said that we, need, we needed 100 years, you know, to, to close the gender inequality gap. And we cannot wait 100 years. I don't want my, my children and grandchildren to live in a, in a world that is so unfair to women and girls. You know, not to mention the, you know, the numbers on increasing in domestic violence. And I think that we have uh, an opportunity. And I said that uh, at the beginning, it's not that conferences solve and transform the world but there are platforms for political commitment. And next year, in March and June, we will be taking part of the Generation Equality Forum, 25 years after the Beijing Platform for Action, and a new feminist agenda. Um, what has changed, I think, since Beijing 25 years ago is the direct involvement, the, the, the passion, the, uh, the creativity for, from young leaders like Ikash and like all of you, you know, that are taking active part in shaping the new uh, feminist agenda. Uh, and I think that uh, we need a, a green and feminist new deal. We spoke about this new pact uh, between to reconcile with nature, but I think to reconcile among us. And the best way to reconcile in our humankind is to cl close the gender equality gap. And it is not only the right choices, the right policies, the right legislation. It is about public investment. It is about having you know, more women CEOs, more women in politics. Uh, it means also to be better represented in decision-making spaces. And not only at government level, but in all levels and walks of life. And, and I think that uh, the leadership of, of Kikash and what the work of, of the Green Hope uh, is teaching all of us is that we are in our hands. And um, I am, uh, again, I repeat, you know, uh, an optimist. And I think that we are going to live 
better days and and we do have the opportunity uh, to close uh, this uh, uh, you know, hurting inequalities between uh, men and women. And uh, I, I took a long time to respond to that specific uh, question. And, and perhaps, I don't know, Kekash, and if we will have the time for closing remarks where I, I would reflect on food security. But just some headlines so we know, you know, we are living, you know, the most unacceptable paradox. Uh, food waste, how much food we waste every day. You know, one of, the, one of the, the biggest public health problems we face is obesity. You know, too much bad quality food, too much food waste. And in contrast, people are dying of, of hunger. And, uh, and this does not happen only in the developing world. Hunger happens in New York, uh, where I lived for several years. Hunger happens in the most, you know, developed wealthy countries. Malnutrition happens, uh, you know, everywhere in every corner of the world. And uh, food security and food sovereignty, it's something that we also have an opportunity to discuss in the upcoming um, Food Systems uh, Summit uh, next, next year. But we can also make the difference in the choices we make every day, not to waste food, to make the right choices when selecting our diet. And believe me, to go back to the origins, to uh, our um, culturally inherited uh, cuisines, it, it's extremely important. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to come up with a recipe here uh, of things to do, but we can make wiser choices in our daily lives and contribute to the global conversation on food security and food sovereignty. I mentioned we only need $5 billion at, to feed the world. That's what the World Food Program has stated. Uh, it is not that much money, is it? So uh, uh, proper choices on priorities and investment uh, is uh, also, uh, you know, a, a much needed uh, challenge for, for next year. And I will close uh, here and leave the space also for my fellow panelists. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Maria. Would any of our other panelists like to answer? Uh, and yes, Dr. Zerbo. You're on mute. I wanted to go on, uh, you know, a kind of, uh, I would say, potpourri to answer uh, those questions, starting from gender equality uh, to, uh, you know, create, I mean, to uh, security issue and then uh, nuclear abolition as well. Gender equality, uh, it takes me back to what this. Uh, uh, Kitagawa said when she talks about uh, uh, being all inclusive, and then she brought the notion of diversity. As a head of an international organization, I can tell you uh, many sit in a room in the public uh, forum and then say, We need more gender balance, more gender balance. And I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, I had uh, two ambassadors who came with a recommendation for uh, a total of six candidates. And they're the ones who are more vocal about uh, gender balance in our plenary. And then I asked them, but uh, you've been talking about gender balance for so long, but in the fourth, in one case, and the two uh, recommendations you brought, they're all male. Only then they realize, oh, we got the recommendation from the capital. Sorry, Dr. Zerbo, we need to go back. The reason why I'm saying this, it's easier to talk about gender balance and not apply it to yourself at home when you start. And then realizing that to bring diversity, to bring gender, it's our own call first before we go out and then speak. It's like you can't talk about environmental issue if you destroy the environment around you. So you have to start by cleaning your doorstep before you talk about others having their doorstep dirty. That's my issue of gender. And that's often linked in diversity because people tend to not see diversity 
as an important player in achieving gender and even creating a community internationally where people can work in harmony. And until and unless we do that, multilateral diplomacy will never succeed. We have to be all inclusive because things change from one region. Today, 75 years after the, the, the United Nations was created, you didn't have so much influence coming from emerging countries and developing countries as you have today. You have more knowledge, capacity has been developed in those parts of the world for them to have a voice. The same way children and youth have a voice today and they didn't have in the past. Kekash, and I'm sure your parents and your grandparents will tell you that uh, 50 years ago, you know, young people of your age didn't have that much voice. They were just following what people tell them to do. So the world is changing. So should we change with the world? We need diversity. We need gender. Because now women are seen to be able to do things that we thought in the past that they could not do or achieve. We see women everywhere. And as a matter of fact, we realize that for security issues, women are more inclined to deal better with security issues than men. Because they're more compassionate about this issue than we are. And then they tend to take it more seriously. And that's probably why we've seen the success of the BAM Treaty. Because there have been many, many more women taking this issue forward and talking about it than we've seen in the past. And that leads me to the topic of security. For me, for world security to succeed and world security to be achieved, we need more women to be part of it. If you have more women in security issue, I think you could go, we will go forward and then we'll succeed. Now, complete nuclear abolition after uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's true. Uh, we've said that the COVID-19 is an opportunity to have brought people to work in cooperation and then see the importance of science. But this cooperation needs a concerted action and global cooperation, but more importantly, greater solidarity. And it's with greater solidarity that we can achieve anything on this planet. We cannot say that nuclear abolition or nuclear disarmament or nuclear non-proliferation belongs to a handful of countries from the West. It belongs to people from the South as it belongs to people from East as well. So we have to get them more involved. We have to develop capacity there and understand their voice and hear their voice and understand their needs as we move forward to creating solutions. And Ms. Kitagawa said another thing that we don't talk much about. And I was happy to hear it from her because that's something that, you know, people tend to, you know, shy away from. The systemic and institutional racism that exists sometimes in what we live on a daily basis, where people don't think that others should have a voice or people don't think that others should be bold enough to talk about their issues, where people don't think that others should be bold enough because they're not part of us to be talking about this issue or that other issue. And I'm glad that is coming from Ms. Kategawa because if I had mentioned it, I can write a book, a thousand pages book on this issue. But with your generation, Kekashan, this will fade out. I think the younger generation are the one that will lead this world into diversity, gender balance, and equality, into public knowledge, into education. And I wanted to come into the word education as well. That was for the previous a set of previous questions, which is how to bring education in the developing world. With the pandemic, we talk about webinars, but Kikasha. Where do you find somebody sitting in Burkina Faso or in Niger or in Uganda, deep down in the village, who has internet connection to be able to follow a webinar that we have now? So we need to give internet access. That could be the now the new means to help people to have education. And a roof 
to work together, we should be able to have bigger screen in the developing world where people have internet connection and they can listen to you from Canada or another one from India or China or Costa Rica or Ecuador or Nicaragua. And that's what we need. So that we make those type of webinar open in a way where people can follow everywhere and that will help in education. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zerbo. And uh, looking at the time, I think we'll have time for one more question. So uh, Pragna, you have the floor. Thank you so much, panelists. Uh, this discussion has been a great learning experience for all of us. Uh, my name is Pragna and I am from the United Arab Emirates. And my question is specifically to Ms. Maria. I read your uh, recent interview with The Guardian where you briefly mentioned the prime Paris uh, Climate Accord. So my question is, do you think the Paris Agreement is enough for countries to achieve their climate goals, especially considering the post COVID-19 scenario? Thank you, Prakna, for your question. Ms. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, dear Pragna, for, for your question. And uh, we already know that the arithmetics of climate change are not working well. Even if we, um, if we comply with all the commitments uh, within the Paris Agreement, it is not going to be enough uh, to keep the 1.5 uh, temperature increase. Uh, it means that we need greater ambition, that we need to go above even the commitments um, agreed upon uh, in the Paris Agreement. And uh, there are recent very promising development with a new paradigm, which is uh, the zero net emission uh, threshold, uh, you know, a new uh, set of commitments that have come uh, from uh, major emitters. Uh, we, we are still waiting with hope, uh, you know, the new uh, climate uh, strategy from the United States. But so far, what we have in hand, it's not, you know, to be neglected. Uh, zero net emissions uh, for uh, 2050 by the European Union, by the Republic of Korea, by Japan, uh, more recently the United Kingdom, uh, and a commitment from China for zero net emissions for 2060. So uh, now uh, the new, uh, the new uh, uh, reference point is the zero net emission commitment. And of course, what comes in between is extremely important. We cannot wait and see what happens in 2050 or 2060. We need short and medium term commitments on mitigation. And for that to happen, we need proper climate finance. Uh, this is a, a, a major, major challenge uh, today to make sure, for example, that uh, the commitments of $100 billion per year to feed the Green Climate Fund needs to become a reality. Um, and, uh, and here again, uh, the uh, public-private uh, partnerships uh, the involvement of civil society, the connection between policy action and science is extremely important. But the Paris Agreement is still our compass, our roadmap. Uh, one of the, uh, I would say, um, fruits of so many years of negotiations. And uh, believe me, after more than two weeks, of lack of sleep and in terms intense negotiations in Paris. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a very good outcome, but uh, we need more, more, more ambition and, and we need uh, to, uh, to uh, couple, you know, com uh, political commitments with actions on the ground and, and especially, you know, uh, looking at the countries that are more vulnerable. Uh, our uh, our friend from the Seychelles and uh, in general, you know, uh, islands, small island developing states, we know that there are uh, fragile and vulnerable and, uh, and we have 
to make sure that we decrease the number of climate refugees, of displaced persons, of people that lose everything. Uh, as you know, I am uh, now uh, in, in Nicaragua, in Managua, and I touched firsthand the devastating effects of Eta and Yota at two hurricanes in less than two weeks, you know, that destroyed everything, uh, all the livelihoods of coastal communities. So um, the, the climate crisis is happening here and now as we speak, and we have to make sure that all the trillions that are used for recovery plans uh, for COVID are properly used and investment uh, are, is uh, wisely uh, done for a true green and digital uh, um, recovery. So that would be uh, my, my answer to you, Pragna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Maria. And uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists and mm -hmm. our audience for such an engaging discussion and such pertinent questions. I would now like to invite our lead discussant, Erin Isabel, Outreach Officer of Green Hope Foundation, to take the floor. Erin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kesha. Hello, everyone. This has been a fantastic discussion. I fervently believe that the process of building back better must begin right now. 2020, as mentioned by our esteemed panelists, truly opened our eyes to the disparities that were already afflicting our world, in addition to the inequalities caused by the pandemic. It has never been more obvious that as we approach 2021, we need to have concrete steps and actions in place to rebuild better. And today's discussion has shown us that the way forward is very hopeful. As a social innovation enterprise, Green Up Foundation has been on the front lines working with immensely vulnerable communities that have been devastated by the impacts of COVID-19. One of the most significant implications of this lockdown has been on the education system. Before the pandemic, it was estimated that there were about 165 million children out of school. Since then, the dropout rate has increased manifold. As always, girls have been affected more than boys. According to recent UNICEF reports, more than 1 billion children are at risk of falling behind due to school closures aimed at containing the spread of COVID-19. While most countries have adopted digital learning, there are 463 million children who cannot be reached by the broadcast and internet-based remote learning policies, either due to the lack of uh, necessary technological assets at home or because they were not targeted by the adopted policies. Education for sustainable development is the cornerstone of Green Up Foundation's advocacy. And when the lockdown was imposed, we also adapted our programs to digital platforms. Our sustainability academies are now conducted online. We created new digital toolkits on the SDGs using visuals to teach the children about each goal, its targets and ways of implementation. We also begin con began conducting our webinars which so far have had an audience of, of over 200,000 people. This is our 40th webinar of the year. And for all of us, it has been an immense learning experience. Yet so much more needs to be done. It is imperative that we reach out and connect to the millions on the dark side of the web. As young people at Green Oak Foundation, we feel that the process of recovery must put the greatest priority on education because that is critical to the empowerment of children and youth who are the largest stakeholders of civil society. We need to begin with those who are usually left behind so that we can redress the deep inequalities that have consistently impeded our progress. Finally, we must use the SDG framework as the blueprint for recovery. Only then can we create an equitable, resilient world where no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin, for sharing your perspectives with us. And I would now like to request our panelists to give their concluding remarks very quickly in 30 seconds. So uh, we shall begin in reverse order. So Ms. Ildiz, you have the floor. Ms. Ildiz, are you 
So yes, um, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here now on video. I think that the sum up by Aaron Isabel has been so quite eloquent and it only uh, is pushing us all to be global advocates to really make this happen. Um, I know that it is unconventional, but I have two little children here that was, they were in for the whole uh, webinar and they have two questions. With your permission, I'll use my seconds to let them talk or uh, ask. Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm seven years old and I have a question. Can you travel in this pandemic? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Jamie. I'm eight years old and my question is, is COVID-19 permanent? I think we have answered the questions already, but they could not let it go but ask the questions. Of course, thank you so much. And thank you to uh, the children for asking their questions. And uh, if our panelists are able to answer them in their 30 seconds as well, that would be absolutely Wonderful. So the next uh, person uh, I'd like to invite is Madam Kiragawa. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Kikashan, and I want to thank all of our panelists and all participants who came on today. It has been an important time to reflect on the global challenge, especially COVID-19 and the impact it's had upon all of us. And what that brings home for me is the fact that where we are is our holy ground and how we are participating to create the place where we live to have greater love, peace and compassion for each other and how it can be more fully expressed. And I want to very quickly share an example about this wonderful professor at an Ivy League university who speaks 17 languages and has been a well-known peacemaker. And he shared how during the time that there was a lot of hoarding of toilet paper, antiseptic wipes, and, and et cetera. He went to the store <clears throat> and made an intentional decision to limit himself to one purchase of toilet paper. And for a man with such a huge brain, with such a prestigious uh, you know, resume, for him, it was an important way to be able to express selflessness mindfulness and thoughtfulness of others who too will be in need of these essential things. And in that fashion, for all of the great ideas and solutions that we have discussed today, may we practice in our daily lives the simple but powerful ways that we can express our selflessness, our thoughtfulness, our compassion and love. And on that, I would like to again wish everyone very happy holidays and may how we live our, cell, our lives during this period of time be an expression of our selfless caring for each other and practice safe public health policies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam Kiragawa. Dr. Zerbo, the floor is yours. You're on mute. Uh, thank you, Kikashin, and then thanks to all the panelists, distinguished uh, uh, youth as well, who have been uh, part of this uh, uh, discussion. So I just want to conclude by saying a few words that resonate after this uh, um, uh, discussion in this uh, virtual panel. The art of dignity and sacredness of life came from Kitagawa. Concerted action and greater solidarity from uh, my sister Espinoza. And she added, nobody's safe until we're all safe. And then another word that I echo that she say is to follow signs and avoid politicization of the pandemic. This is what we have to do. And then I will add to that solidarity, diversity, and inclusiveness as we move towards this holiday season 
I wish you all Merry Christmas for those who celebrate Christmas. Happy end of the year and then Happy New Year as well as we move into a 221 that we hope will be safe for all of us and then safe to work and then safe to travel as the little girl asked if we can travel during the pandemic so that we can go and see her on an island and then work together with many of you guys. We have to develop capacity. I often say I don't like the word building capacity because I said the capacity exists already. We have to develop capacity. So happy new year and then thanks to you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerbo. Ms. Maria, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, dear Kakashin. I would only say that I am convinced that next year is going to be a better year uh, for humanity and for nature. And that uh, in order to make it a better year, uh, we have uh, to take part of uh, a global uh, concerted action and co-responsibility. Um, and that requires, of course, uh, more understanding, more love, uh, more tolerance uh, among us. And uh, I would like to also convey my greetings to my fellow panelists, to your outstanding uh, colleagues of work, Erin uh, Shaik, to the work of the Green Hope Foundation. And the Green Hope Foundation gives us, uh, believe me, great hope uh, to see all these young, intelligent, um, uh, you know, um, men and women that are truly making the difference, are really uh, co-creating a planet that is worth living in. So uh, I would like to, to close uh, with, uh, with a quote, if you, if you allow me, of uh, the uh, uh, laureate uh, uh, winner, Elie Weissel. And, and he said uh, something that I, I really, uh, I really uh, support and echo. And he said that the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it is indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it is indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it is indifference. And I, I think that the antidote to uh, the current crisis is not to be indifferent. It is to be co-responsible. Uh, thank you, thank you for, for everything uh, you do and thank you for making uh, this world a better place. Uh, it's been a privilege to take part of this conversation, but of previous conversations as, as well. Uh, a big uh, hug to Audrey, to Lacina, to my sister, Eve Lees, that I had the privilege to meet her incredible children. And, uh, and, and thank you, thank you once again. And, uh, uh, greetings and in, in peace to all of you. Thank you so much, Miss Maria, and thank you to all our panelists for your insightful comments and suggestions. As you have rightly stressed, multilateralism and collaboration will be the cornerstones of the process of recovery. And of course, we also need greater transparency and accountability from all stakeholders so that we can rebuild that common trust and the problems are simply too gigantic for solutions to be found without the seamless cooperation of everyone. And the road ahead will not be easy, but history bears witness to the fact that humanity has always come out stronger after each catastrophe. So thank you once again for your time during this holiday season. Your support for our cause is deeply appreciated. And as we go into the new year, let us resolve to build forward better. So please stay safe. Uh, please wear your masks whenever required as the pandemic is still not over. Take very good care of your loved ones and yourself so that together we are able to usher in the new year on a very positive note. Remember, we can do it. We hope to be able to meet you in person in 2021, the year that will be the beginning of the new normal. 
Thank you very much. And here's wishing you happy holidays from Green Hill Foundation. Thank you so much, everyone, and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.